Our scripture for this morning comes from Exodus chapter 20, as far as the reading of the law. Exodus 20, verses 1 and 2, and then verse 17. And then we will turn to Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 through 13 for our sermon text. First Exodus 20, and then Philippians chapter 4. From Exodus 20, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Verse 17, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And then turn over to Philippians chapter 4. We'll see the opposite of covetousness. Philippians chapter 4. And beginning with verse 10. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low. And I know how to abound in any and every circumstance. I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. The grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. The Tenth Commandment, in some ways, is a summary commandment related to all of the second table of the law. And we've been saying as we've been been going through the commandments that all of them relate not just to outside behavior, but they all relate to the heart. And this is the way that Jesus taught about the Ten Commandments. The commandment against murder, if you hate you've violated that commandment. The commandment against adultery, if you've lusted, you have violated that commandment. The commandment against stealing, if you have inordinately desired that which is not yours, or if you've been greedy, you have violated that commandment. Um, The um, the, uh, commandment against bearing false witness, If you have privately engaged in deceit, you have violated that commandment. This is the way that Jesus taught about the commandments, particularly in the Sermon on the Mount, but in other places as well. But if you've thought that your pastor has overstated that over the last several weeks, the linchpin of all of this comes with the 10th commandment which makes clear that violation of these things, that lusting after your neighbor's life or his servants or his his wife uh, and, and so forth, violations of the other commandments, doing so in your heart by coveting is a violation of God's law. Now, most of the other commandments, if they are violated in their most severe form, Um, They can be the breaking of laws. And so if you kill somebody, you are subject to the laws of the state. If you steal somebody's property, you can be subject to the law of the state. For the most part, there aren't really laws against coveting. And as a matter of fact, nobody else may know that you are coveting. Because these are matters of the heart. And so you could be the most covetous person in the room, or I could be the most covetous person person in the room, and in all likelihood, nobody else would ever know it because it's a matter of the heart. Unless it seeps out into behavior, then we never know about it uh, necessarily. And so it's a private sin. And yet it's a very serious sin because, again, what starts on the outside works its way out into violations of these other commandments related to love of neighbor. And we see that in the Bible. So David, King David, coveted 
his neighbor's wife, violating the Tenth Commandment. He had her brought to him and committed adultery with her, Seventh Commandment. She became pregnant, and so he concocted a lie to cover up what he had done, Ninth Commandment. And when the lie didn't work, he had her husband killed, Sixth Commandment. But it all started with the command against coveting. Or there's another story in the Bible that we perhaps could relate to it. King Ahab wanted a vineyard in Jezreel that was owned by a man named Naboth. And Naboth refused to sell it to him. But Ahab coveted that property. And so conspiring with his wife, Jezebel, he had lies told about the owner of the property at a trial, Ninth Commandment, resulting in Naboth's execution, Sixth Commandment, and the stealing of Naboth's property, Eighth Commandment. And so we see how coveting something in the heart is at the foundation of violations of all these other commandments related to the second table of the law. And so in a couple of weeks, we'll talk more about the negative side of, that, of this, about the sin of covetousness, but that's pretty much all I intend to say about that this morning. For the remainder of today, I want to talk about the opposite of covetousness, because covetousness is countered by a positive duty that we have, and that is the duty of contentment the duty of what the Puritan Jeremiah Burroughs referred to as the rare jewel of Christian contentment. Contentment, unlike covetousness, trusts in the provision and the providence of God, while covetousness complains against the providence and the provision of God. And so we want to look at that together today using... Philippians chapter 4 as our text. And the first thing I want us to notice from Philippians 4 is what I'm calling an application of the passage. And especially looking at verse 13, I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. There is perhaps no more abused passage in all of the Bible then Philippians 4.13, you've probably seen pictures of cheerleaders holding up placards for the fans in the stadium. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. The, the idea is given that this verse is something that can be used by motivational speakers in a general way. Whatever it is I want to do, whether it is to win the uh, industry award uh, that I uh, work in this year, or whether it's to win the football game next weekend. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. And yet, even though the passage is used that way so frequently, that's a misuse of the passage. Uh, I would compare it to um, Matthew 7, 1. Judge not lest you can be judged which is the other passage in the New Testament that so many people know and so many people know incorrectly. And so it, th this is an abused passage so often. In order really to understand the context or the meaning of verse 13, you have to look at the context of the preceding verses where we find out that really Paul is not speaking of something that works in motivational speeches, but rather he's speaking of the idea that whether things go well and we win or whether things go badly and we lose, I can still be content. Don't try that at the pep rally before the game. The coach will not appreciate it. If I lose, I'm still okay. That's not the message that they want to put out. And there is a context to this. I wouldn't suggest that as Christians we should put out that message prior to the football game. We want to win. But nonetheless, that's not what Paul has in mind here. The Philippians had just sent him a gift. And by the way, Paul here is in prison. Um, that doesn't mean that he had free room and board. And so gifts 
helped him survive in prison. And so he was appreciative, but he also wanted them to hear a spiritual lesson. He was appreciative because they had thought of him and that they had given him a gift, but he was appreciative of because of what that had to say about his, their generosity toward him, about their valuing Paul as a missionary and his work in the faith. And so it was not just that they made his life easier. No doubt he was grateful for that, but he could get along without it. But he was appreciative because they actually remembered to him and they supported uh, him in the gospel. So he makes clear that whether in plenty or in want, whether in hunger or whether in uh, feasting, that he was content. He could do all things through Christ who gives him strength. And so that's the idea of this passage that regardless of my current lot in life, in Christ, I have everything I need for contentment. Even if things have gone differently than I had hoped, or by the way, even if things have gone as I've hoped and I'm still disappointed, have you ever experienced that? You achieve your dream and then you're left with, so what? Some people talk about that kind of disappointment with success. And so Paul says, whether successful or whether my dreams have been dashed, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. He's talking about a kind of contentment that many of us might rarely know and that yet ought to be normative for the Christian. And so having seen that application, and it seems to be kind of a high mountain to climb, I would have you to think with me about the author. Who is it that's writing this? Because you might say, well, Harry, that sounds really nice, but that's pie in the sky. Are you telling me that if I've lost my job, lost my family, lost my uh, place in business, lost whatever, that I still can be content? Yeah, right. If I can lose something that I've invested so much in, family, church, whatever, and it doesn't work out the way I thought, are you telling me I can still be content? Yeah, right. Well, it's not just the preacher that's saying this. It's the Apostle Paul that's saying it. And, and we ought to believe it just because it's in Scripture and that Scripture is sufficient to teach us about life. But we see that more fully when we think about who it is that the Holy Spirit is using to pen these words. If anybody knew what he was talking about on this subject, it was the Apostle Paul. Paul was a highly respected Pharisee. He had trained under the best teacher in Jerusalem, Gamaliel. When he finished, his regard was such that when the Pharisees had a high priority that they wanted to accomplish, snuffing out Christianity, they gave the job to Saul of Tarsus, to Paul. They said, you take charge of this. It's your job. And that's a, an indication of how highly re they regarded him. It was a top priority. He was zealous with regard to it, and he took it on. And then he converted to faith in Christ. And those who had trusted him considered it the utter betrayal that the one that had been zealous against the cause of Christ was now calling himself a Christian. Some people say that when you become a Christian, life gets easier. That was not the experience of Paul. He lost all of his friends. And actually, those that used to be his friends set out to kill him. And so one of the first things that Paul dealt with and that he dealt with for the remainder of his life were death threats. All that he had stood for for the first part of his life was now in shambles. And those who had been friends threatened to kill him. You know more of the story. 
Paul was consistently persecuted, beaten and left for dead, thrown in prison. Some funny person had the idea of putting together a cover letter if Paul had been a modern minister applying for uh, the pastorate of a church, looking for a pastoral charge. Dear church search committee, I've been out in and out of jail many times. I've never stayed at any congregation for very long because my preaching tends to start riots um, and so forth. Um, he might have had a difficult time. Um, and, and so there is the ongoing persecution. Even if you don't think about the persecution, consider this. Paul was so committed to the cause of Christ that he undertook an unbelievably rigorous program of travel over, three, over the course of three missionary journeys and possibly a fourth journey to Spain after release from his first Roman imprisonment. At a time when travel was not easy. Yeah, the Roman roads were the best in the ancient world, but travel was not particularly safe. It was particularly arduous. If you wanted to get in the, uh, if you wanted to get um, in your way, get into your way of travel and go to Austin this evening, it would take more than an hour and a half in Paul's day, because it was on foot to, or on a donkey, and so it was not easy. And by every indication we have, and there, there are a handful of indications in the New Testament, Paul was not a man of good health. And so this man of questionable health undertook this program of intense travel, regularly enduring beating, all for the cause of Christ. If you look at somebody with a silver spoon in his mouth and they say, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me, you might say, yeah, right. But Paul had no silver spoon. Paul had handed the silver spoon off to the next guy and lived a, lived a rigorous, persecuted life. And that's the one that says to us, whether my dreams have come true or whether they've been shattered, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And so it's a testimony not to the grit of Paul. I don't want to give that idea. Because Paul, like all of the Old Testament saints and like others we see in the New Testament, had clay feet. It's not the testimony of a great man. It is the testimony of the adequacy of Christ. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. If Paul was a great man, there's nothing for us to learn here because I can look at it and say, well, that's good, but I'm not a great man. But Paul had a great Savior. And it's because Paul had a great Savior that he can say, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. And we've talked about Paul. I should also mention that Paul is writing these words to the Philippian church. And he would not dare give them pie in the sky because they also were a suffering congregation. In chapter 1 and verse 29 he writes to the, the, to the church, It has been granted to you that for the sake of Christ you should not only believe in him, but also suffer for his sake. And so Paul, who even at this time was still in prison, Paul is suffering and writes to a people who are suffering. And he says, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. You know, the reality is that all of us either have experienced disappointment, are experiencing disappointment, or will experience disappointment. And all of us need to find and can find strength in Christ. Will those disappointments be 
job loss, financial difficulty, family disappointments, or at the end of life, the end of life, all of us one day will face those things. And so we need to understand that Christ provides strength um, that we can endure those disappointments and still induce and still do so contentedly. Somebody has said that the author of Ecclesiastes, who wrote Vanity of Vanities, All is Vanity Under the Sun, was not just saying that life when we fail is disappointing. But he was saying that life, even when we succeed, ends up frequently having its disappointments. As I mentioned earlier, sometimes we are successful with our endeavors and we end up saying, so what? Being a sports fan, I sometimes, my favorite as far as celebrations is basketball because they're on a relatively small court out in the middle of thousands of people. And I've watched as uh, the collegiate, the NCAA championship is won in what used to be March Madness, and now it extends into April. But, but anyway, you see these young men in utter ecstasy. Is it possible ever to express happiness in a greater way? The, the, the entire physical expression of thrill. What a joy. But I wonder about those guys that are, you know, 80 years old, and they're still telling the story. Yeah, back when I was 22. <laughs> Even those long ago victories can age and seem disappointing. And so even in victory, we need the message, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. So we need to, we've seen the author and we've seen the application, but thirdly, I would have you to notice with me the ability. How is it that we can say we can do all things through Christ? What does this mean that Christ gives us strength? And in order to get there, I want to mention what are some of the sources of discontentment. There are many things in life that cause us to be discontent or uh, the other side of this is to say that they cause us to be covetous um, of the advantages that others have that we do not. We can be covetous because we see that our neighbors, our friends, people that we know had advantages that we do not have. Or we can see that we made bad decisions at some point in life, and the bad decisions set us back. And so we end up discontent, thinking... I'll never be able to achieve what I did, uh, what I could have, because I never had those advantages. I never had that family. I didn't uh, have these uh, opportunities that other people have, or I had the opportunity, and I messed it up. We can be discontent, as I've said, because we reached our goals, but still found ourselves disappointed with life. Like Alexander the Great, we can conquer the world and still find ourselves looking for something else to do. And so in order to find strength, to find contentment in the midst of disappointment, I would suggest that there are three things that we should think about this morning. The first is, in order to be content, we need to trust in God's providence. We need to trust in God's providence. You know, even if you did not have the upbringing, the guidance, the educational advantages, the financial start to life, the things that you might have wanted, even if you lacked those things that others had and, you know, others hit the ground running in life and you were trying to dig yourself out of a hole, even so, we need to be reminded that God in his providence gave us the things that he wanted us to have so that we could live the life that he wants us. We have to trust in God's providences. This is a lesson I've personally had to learn in life. Many of you, most of you know that 
I came here as your pastor out of 20, after 25 years in secular employment. And sometimes I've sat around feeling sorry my, for myself, wondering, what if? Those years I could have been serving the church vocationally. Those years I could have been doing something else. Those years I could have been studying and preaching. And what if? But trust in God's providences means that I have to believe that God gave me those years in the wilderness so that I can learn things that I pray would be helpful as I serve you now. And so there has to be a trust in God's providences. And so I would encourage you to apply that to your own life. Some of us have experienced what we might consider wasted years or wasted time or wasted thought and effort, but we have to trust in God's providences. No doubt Paul could have thought, boy, I could serve the Lord a lot more if I wasn't stuck in prison. And yet it was because he was in prison that he had a ministry to his prison guards and even to Caesar's household. Because that providentially, that's where God had put him. Second, not only must we trust in God's providence, but we also must have faith in God's provision. If we focus on whether we are keeping up with the Joneses, we are likely to be discontent because there's always another Jones that's ahead of us. We often think about that in financial ways, but it applies to other areas of life as well. Why aren't my kids better behaved? Why isn't my wife better than me? She's not here, but I'm not talking about her. Uh, why, why is it that I don't get the credit that my coworker gets uh, for what he's doing? Why, why is it that I'm not coming out ahead and everybody else does? Paul speaks of contentment even if we are not fulfilling the American dream or living up to what we imagine our neighbors have, and frequently we only think our neighbors are doing so well because we only see the outside of the home. And so we shouldn't worry about keeping up with the Joneses, but rather we should love the Joneses and have faith in God's provision. Finally, in order to be content, we have to look to God's promises. Contentment comes with realizing that because we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ, we have possessions that we can never lose. Um, by coincidence, as I was heading to my mom's funeral, I packed the most recent book that I had gotten from my Amazon order. And it was a book on, um, it was entitled The End of the Christian Life. And the th one of the themes of the book is that understanding your mortality is important to really being able to understand the life that we are living here. And that's an amazingly important truth. The reality is that contentment has helped if I recognize that God has given to me things that will never be taken away. Because at the end of the day, um, much of what we have will be left to others and it will no longer be ours. And like my mother this last week, we'll be put in a casket and be put in the ground and we'll possess nothing. Possess nothing that belongs to this earth. And yet we will possess all that we have because of the promises of Christ. We know that we will live forever with him. We know that we will be reunited with those whom we love in the faith. And we know that when we've been there, not 70 years plus seven, but when we've been there 10,000 years, right? Shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. Recognizing that changes the way that we think about contentment. So I've I mentioned a thing or two about the th sources of discontentment I've struggled with. I hope that as I've talked about my own 
that you'll think about yours. And that with regard to your disappointments or your discontentments, that you'll think about them in light of God's providential care for you. That you'll think about them in light of God's promises for you. That you'll think about them in view of God's provision for you. And that God will teach us that rare jewel of Christian contentment.